Welcome to the Power of Purity podcast, the show that empowers men to experience their sexual gift in a healthier way. Now here's your host, Tony Ingrassia. Welcome back to the Power of Purity podcast. So glad you could join us for this episode. And if you were with us uh, in the last episode, I began to interview a friend of mine, Chris Bishop, uh, who's married to his wife, Jamie, and they have quite an amazing story, the journey of their life, their marriage, their hearts, and even the way God has worked in their sexual selves is, uh, I think it's fair to say it's a miracle. And Chris began to share his story with us last time, and we're going to continue our story with Chris Bishop today. So, Chris, welcome back. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here. I I was really blessed by our last episode. I I think you guys have an amazing story. And you had brought us up to the point to where uh, you kind of explained uh, the ongoing struggle that you were having in your heart and life with your sexual self uh, a struggle with perpetual lust, masturbation, internet pornography. You thought that when you got married that all these problems would go away, but but you learned that, in fact, this stuff followed you into your marriage. Marriage didn't fix your problem. Really what marriage did was expose the issues that were still alive in your heart and life. And uh, so you're acting out in the context of your mar- marriage and l- looking at porn. Your wife catches you. She's hurt. You try not to do it again. You do it again over and over and over. This becomes a kind of cycle. Your wife is really hurt by this. And uh, there's like this growing distance between the two of you, uh, this disconnection because of these problems. And uh, all of a sudden, another man comes into the picture And your wife begins to get emotionally and then physically involved with this other man. And I think that's where we left off. So if we could continue from there. Yeah. So like I was saying, I had um, I had found out early. I had confronted it with love, with forgiveness. And I thought that was the catalyst that I would need um, to maybe be done with my own problems, with my own addictions. Uh, that this was maybe the wake-up call that God needed to use in my life. Um, Unfortunately, um, I'm not even sure of the exact timeline. I had thought it was a little bit longer, but I was talking to my wife a while ago, and she says it it wasn't as long as I was remembering. But whether it had been six months or just a few months, it did not take long, even after this, um, for pornography to, to creep back in. And, uh, and I failed again. And, and the pattern, the cycle in my life, even though I had confronted this issue with Jamie, just started back up. And, right. and it makes sense to me because the fact is at this point in your life, uh, you hadn't really dealt with any of your root issues yet. You, you really uh, hadn't dealt with some of these root issues. And so therefore the fruit keeps coming out. Yeah. So, so we're kind of stuck again. This, from the from when I had kind of you know everything came out. I think it was a period of seven years that this cycle is continuing, and I have a way of kind of putting the blinders on. Um, so I would describe our marriage over that seven years as okay. You know, I wouldn't say it was great, but I felt like it was okay. You know, we had four children. Um, I loved my wife. I knew my wife loved me. Um, I love my kids. I have great kids. And uh, we were busy and things you just live in life, you know. And um, so I I felt like things were all right. You know, we could have a better marriage, but I didn't feel like we had a bad marriage. Right. Um, but, but woven through the tapestry of your of your lives and marriage is this perpetual ongoing cycle on again, off again, on again, off again, with pornography, you acting out, Jamie finding out, being hurt, being uh, blaming herself, being confused, feeling rejected. So that's just part of the underlying foundation of your lives. Right. And uh, so like, like you, I, I like what you said, you, you, in a sense, had blinders on so really, maybe things weren't as good, really, as you were trying to pretend like they were. 
I, they, they were not. And my wife was saying things that were confusing my picture of, of how okay we were. Um, it, she was not like in church as much. She was starting to say things, kind of questioning her salvation at times. And when I would talk to her about these things, she would just get angry. So I would kind of back away from those conversations um, but at the same time, like I said, I, I'm pretty good at wearing these blinders. So I would focus on the good things. We'd laugh. We'd have this. We'd have that. Um, we, you know, we were playing bridge together. Um, the, this other couple, we, uh, you know, like I said, I had forgiven them. So they were back in our lives and we'd hang out with them and we'd hang out with our other friends. And, um, you know, so we were just living life and I, I'm thinking things are all right. You know, and, and in the meantime, you didn't know that the affair had started up again between your wife and this man. Absolutely. Shortly after I had failed, um, Jamie began to get involved in this relationship again. And this time I did not find out um, for a long time. Um, so, like I said, I think it was a period of about seven years that this affair was going on um, and I had no no knowledge. Every once in a while something might strike me the wrong way, um, but I would convince myself that that was just me, you know, not being the forgiving guy that I was supposed to be, not, not showing God's forgiveness and, you know, I shouldn't tell myself I shouldn't feel suspicious and um, so I would just, again, put the blinders on and, wow. and keep living life. That's amazing, Chris. It it, it just speaks of a kind of, uh, I don't know, just a, the word that occurs to me is duplicity. There, there's a kind of duplicity in your lives because you're together for this seven-year period. You're married. You're living your lives. But you have your thing going on over here with your struggle with lust and masturbation and pornography, your cycle. And Jamie over here is involved in this affair with this man. So it's like you both almost have like these secret lives and struggles, yet you're married together. But it, it feels like there's an iceberg. There's this gigantic thing under the surface that's just lurking. Absolutely. And so if we, we skip to the head of, to the end of that seven years... Um, I, I found out, you know, I, I found something on my wife's computer that alerted you, know, you that, that, holy cow, something's going on. This is still happening. And so when she came home, I confronted her immediately. And I'll be honest, I thought this would be the same that it was when I caught it early. Um, I was obviously upset, but again, I, I struggle with sexually. According to scriptures, every time I've lusted after a woman, I've committed adultery. So whereas she's having adultery with one man and maybe it's physical, I've had adultery in my mind with I can't even count how many different women. So uh, even though you had caught her, you're in the position to fight for your marriage. You're willing to forgive her. Uh but but of course you had to confront her. Absolutely. And so so again, I'm thinking we're back where we were at the start. We're going to confront this. We're going to deal with it. And we'll be stronger because of it because I know the way God works. And so I lay it out there and I expect the same thing that happened the first time, which was my wife being repentant and, you know, she's going to cry and I'm going to comfort her. And, you know, this is what's going to happen. And I'm shocked because that's not what I get at all. Wow. Jamie just looks at me coldly, and she's like, okay, so now you know. Now what? And it's like, okay. <laughs> um, and so I start to talk, well, we need to work on this. We need to talk about it. We need to, and she's just, she just told me, she's like, I'm not sure I want to do that, Chris. I think uh, I'm tired of this. Holy cow. She was coming to the end. She, she, it sounds like she was broken. She was ready to give up. She was ready to hit the eject button on this marriage. Yeah. All of a sudden, things started adding up. You know, I had mentioned that she had started to question her salvation, and I didn't understand it. Um, what, what had happened is she was becoming numb. Um, first of all, it was my sin and she saw me stuck in this cycle and she'd prayed and from her perspective, God wasn't helping. 
And then she got trapped in her own cycle. And, and it wasn't like she was just okay with it. She fought against it. She prayed. She asked God to help. And she felt like there was nothing. And so she just felt trapped and she started to feel like she was, th- this is just what we were both destined to live with. It, it feels like a loss of hope that, that her hope was gone. Now, she had no hope that you guys could change, that you would ever change, that she could change, that the marriage would change. It, she just, her hope was gone. There's no doubt that's exactly where she was at. She was, uh, she was at the end where she just, uh, she, it wasn't, I think she even told me, it's not that I don't believe that God's real. I just, I don't, I don't think he's going to help. Wow. You know? I, so what in the world happened then at this point? You, you have a wife that's ready to give up. Yeah, so I I wasn't okay with that, and I wanted to talk to her about it, and I wanted to work through it. And uh, she just told me, she's like, Chris, I, I need some space. I need to figure this stuff out. Um, and so I, I gave her that space. I told her, you know, whatever you need. Um, she was going to go stay with one of her girlfriends. And uh, it was that night. This was probably about three days after I had confronted her, if my memory's right. Um, but we got in the van that night and she was, this was the first night she was not staying at the house. So it made this all feel very real. And, um, in the van, there was just kind of this awkward silence. I I had climbed in before she left because I wanted to say something to her, but I didn't know what to say. I didn't know what words to use. And as I was sitting there, I kind of heard God speak to me, you know, not audibly, but I I knew it was him and I knew what he was saying. And um, I just very clearly God communicated to me that what I was seeing here was the cost of my sin. I felt like he was saying, Chris, for most of your life, I mean, at this point, it'd probably been 20 plus years. um, You've struggled with this. And you keep asking me for forgiveness, and I keep forgiving you. And as long as you keep asking me for forgiveness, I will keep forgiving you. But you need to see that there's a cost to your sin. Wow. That's so powerful, Chris. And and what he was showing me, that cost, I was staring at it. Um, The cost is your marriage. The cost is is your wife's heart and loss of hope and ready to give up. Yeah, I, I, I'm I losing my wife. Um, it, it's obviously hurting my marriage. My children um, could be losing a mom. You know, we have four beautiful kids. You know, what's this going to do to them? Um, but what was most powerful to me, God bringing back all those moments that Jamie was questioning her salvation and seeing how hard she had gotten, how hard her heart had gotten. Um, it was like God was saying, Chris, your wife's salvation is at stake here. I mean, the, the, this is, is it worth it? Is your sin, is pornography, is lust worth your wife? Is it worth your children's mother? Is it worth Jamie's salvation? And it was just like, I was just completely overcome. Holy cow. It's um, like God, God pulled back the curtain and gave you a glimpse. You could see the consequence of your sin. Yeah. And, and what, you know, the Scripture talks about, don't be deceived. What a man sows, he will reap. And it, it feels almost like this was harvest day. You had been sowing and sowing and sowing to the seeds of of the flesh, sexual sin and lust and pornography, sowing seeds. And there's a problem with seeds. They grow and they produce a harvest. And and all of a sudden this day has come and, and you're seeing the harvest of your sin. Right. And uh, it was, you know, that night in the, vow, the, the van, I just kind of said, I, I actually said to Jamie, I said, never again. Um, and she, she said, I don't believe you. 
Um, and rightfully, rightfully so, right? Yeah, I mean, that, that she'd seen this pattern too long. Uh, um, but I really did feel something fundamental had shifted in me, um, that God had revealed to me that this isn't, this isn't no big deal. You know, I, I always knew it was wrong, but at the end of the day, I could convince myself that oh, it's not that bad. You minimized you know? it. Yeah, and, and so the, the the full cost was finally staring me in the face, and um, I, I pleaded with God, you know, which I had done before, but I, I had pleaded, I pleaded with God, that you've got to take this. You have to do this because I can't. I've proven that. Praise and, God. And... Um, that she, feels like, by the way, in the, in the economy of God's kingdom, that feels like a really, really good place to be coming to, a place of a kind of collapse, a, 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 a place of hitting the bottom, of surrender, a place of emptiness, a place of brokenness, a, a, a place of crying out to God from a, a m- more broken place in your own heart than you had ever been in your life. God, you have to help me. You have to change me. You have to show up, God. You have to do something for me that I have not been able to do. It's like it feels like you're in a more desperate place in this moment than you've ever been in your life. Yes, absolutely. And you know why? Because the stakes are so high. Because you're losing the most important things in your life. You're losing your marriage. You're losing your wife. You're losing your family. It's like, holy cow. And no wonder you're so desperate. Like you're seeing the consequences of your sin. Right. And um, she left, you know, she 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 moved down. And uh, and by, by the way, if I could just comment there, then going back to our previous episode, you mentioned that, you know, I, I, I we began by talking that the day that you and Jamie walked into the Power of Purity Conference, the day that I met you, you said Jamie had just come home. So you guys were sep- so this is the separation. This is the night that she left you. Right. Yep. And uh I I began when she left, I began pursuing her like really like I never did. Um like it I just had like this single minded thought that I need my wife back. So so you weren't willing to let her go. You you were gonna fight for her. Correct. And I fought so much to the point where she was like, leave me alone. Um, I mean, she was like, how you're not giving me space. How, you know, I, how am I supposed to think and process if you're always trying to talk to me? Um, Cause I was emailing her and I, texting her and call, trying to call her. And um, she was just like, back off. Um, and, and so I did a little bit trying to respect her, but, but I, I, also kept kept knocking because I knew, you know, I, I really feel like God was taking over here because this is not me, as my wife can attest to. Um, this is not my normal behavior um, to be this persistent. Mm-hmm. Um, but I but I did. I pursued her, and it was actually in a relatively short period of time. We were very blessed. Within a week. My wife decided that she was going to come home. Um, she came home very mistrusting. She came home convinced that this was going to happen again and we were going to be in the same spot. Hmm. But she said, you know what? I don't want to, I don't. I, I think really what it was is, is that the alternative to coming home didn't seem good (laughs) Mm -hmm. you know what's she gonna do she she knew the relationship with this other man needed to end um remember she had been trying to fight against that for many of those years um so what's she gonna do is she gonna move back home you know to to, she's from indiana and i you know we we were in missouri um is she gonna move back home um she you know that you know, it, it feels like she just didn't have any reasonable alternatives. In the meantime, you're beginning to pursue her. Yeah. So I, she decides to come home, but she comes home with a very untrusting heart toward you and, and very little hope. Yes. Now, with that being said, 
you know, we, we had this new passion kindled and, um, and, and then we start to see this stuff where, you know, I had mentioned that going to that power of purity conference was a miracle. Um, and it, it was just one of many, it's like, God just kept doing these things in our lives, um, that, that were undeniably him. Um, and we just kept seeing all this stuff happen. I mean, to the point where the other man, when she when she made it, she had broken it off with him, but they had still been communicating via text up until the Power of Purity conference. And when she was sitting downstairs listening to the same message that I was listening to upstairs, God began to penetrate her heart, and she knew, okay, just communicating at all, it, it can't happen. Right. We've got to be done, done. Praise God. And so she sent him, I, I think she might have even said, this is the final text, we've got to be done. And and she told him where he was at. I mean, th- again, this is just one of the miracles of God. That man had remembered reading your book or, or buying your book. He had never read it, sat down, read through it in the night. And, you know, I, I don't know ultimately where he's at or what his story is today. But, you know, even seeing God working on him through us at the conference. I mean, j- just like I said, there's just so many things. God, God had his hand in our marriage so powerfully. Praise God. It's the it's the day of redemption. It feels like God is showing up, and it's almost like God said, okay, enough of all this nonsense. I'm going to break into your lives. I'm going to break into your hearts and your situation, and we're going to start initiating some radical redemptive change. Correct. And, and we just saw one thing after another. And it, you know, when she came home to me, she made it clear that she still wasn't sure where she was at with God, you know. So she, she came home to me, but she had not come home to God yet. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I got to see something really neat happen because over those next couple months, you know, it's like, like I had wooed my wife's heart back in, in a week. <laughs> It, like I said, I think only through the grace of God. Um, but then over the next couple of months, I saw God wooing my wife. And that was just absolutely amazing. Praise God. Um, and, How would you put words to that? I mean, what, what was going on? I, I mean, just thing after thing. You know, I, I can't even put my finger on all these little miracles in our life. But I know we kept looking at each other saying, wow, that was God. That was God. That was God. And, and so she... She's starting to see all this stuff that's just undeniably things that the Lord is doing for us. And it's softening her. So, so she's going to church and um, she's she's beginning to weep as we as we worship. You know, the songs are starting to just communicate with her powerfully, um, which, you know, she, she wasn't doing that before. She was just kind of zoning out, um, focused on, you know, anything but what she was singing to God and now this was was penetrating her. She would drive to work, and she'd just have the radio on, and it's she kept singing. You know, it's like every song. It's like was written for me right now for what I'm right. feeling Praise for what God. I'm thinking. I know that that God uses music in a very powerful way in Jamie's heart, and uh, you know what it speaks of. You were talking before about how it felt like over the years her heart was becoming more and more hardened more calloused, you know, and it feels like God is reversing that that process now, and her heart is be, beginning to soften and become more tenderized. I, I love this metaphor, because uh, I feel like God did this in Sherry's heart through through our dark days, that there was a sense in which Sherry's heart was very frozen and very hard. And imagine taking an ice cube and if you just began to breathe on it with your breath, like that, the warm breath over that ice cube very, very slowly would begin to affect it and begin to, to begin to melt it. And uh, it just feels like God is beginning to breathe on your lives and God is beginning to breathe on Jamie's heart. Yeah, absolutely. Praise God. And so, um, I mean, this is really more her story than it is mine, but, 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 you know, it was a good Friday sitting in your counseling office where Jamie finally saw the 
truth of the cross and that that applied to her too. Praise God. And when that, when that realization came over her, um, I mean, she just, it was just so wonderful to see what God did in her that, you know, that night, um, she, she was just weeping for joy because the truth that Jesus died for her, that nothing she did was too bad, just finally permeated her heart. And, um, and she accepted it. She accepted that, yeah, Christ's death means that, yeah, I messed up and I committed sins, but he died for those. He paid the penalty for those. I don't have to punish myself. Christ took my punishment and, now what I need to do is just thank him and appreciate him and worship him. And then, I mean, you know, God's used her tremendously. She's, she speaks to other women now and she ministers and she shares, um, you know, how God's worked in her and through her. And um, it's just a joy to watch. Amen. Praise be to God. That's totally awesome. So it feels like something's coming back to life now. And uh, I love the the concept of the template of the gospel. The gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And it speaks of God's ability to bring something back to life that used to be dead. Jesus was dead. He was in the tomb. And then he rose from the dead. That's what the gospel is. So there's no situation that's outside of God's redemptive reach. And in a very real way, your marriage was dead Jamie left. There was no hope. You guys were over. Mm-hmm. And and somehow, through the miracle of the gospel and the power of God, God is bringing something back to life now that used to be dead. Right. Without Praise a doubt. be to God. That's awesome. So all of this now happens about four years ago, and then you guys continue on doing some counseling. You're going to church, and you're getting healthier and healthier for the past four years. And uh, would you say that the the past uh, four, you got you said you guys have been married how long? Seventeen, 17 years, almost so, seventeen. So, so in a way, it's fair to say the first thirteen were pretty disoriented and confusing and upside down and filled with dilemma and consequence, but the last four years you've been on your journey of redemption now. Yeah, marriage just keeps getting better and better. Um, It's still hard work, you know, but, um, yeah, God's way too good to us, way too good to me. Praise God. So uh, in our last few minutes here, I I have at least two more questions I want to ask. The, The first one is, you know, you promised Jamie that night in the van, I will never look at porn again. And and she came home, and, and God has worked so deeply and powerful, powerfully in you guys. And, uh, uh, but I, I guess what I want to ask, how, how, has, how has that old cycle for you, that old entrapment with pornography, how, how have you done with that? How is that unfolding for you? Yeah, it it does not have the hold on me that it did, um, but I have not um, kept that promise. Um, the uh, there there have still been struggles. Uh, the The frequency of those struggles, the intervals in between them, um, are amazing compared to where I was before. Praise God. Um, and that's nothing but God's grace that that's done that. But but no, I have not been been perfect now i will say um i i i god prepared i don't even know how to say this exactly but god brought jamie to a place um he gave me victory long enough that 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 jamie and i can still fight through this together um i understand it it, it it feels like you're saying uh, you're not perfect. You have stumbled at times in the past four years. You've acted out. You've actually looked at porn a, a few times, right? Mm-hmm. And then you, you're pledged to confess to Jamie immediately if you mess up, which you have done. So it's something you guys are working, continuing to work through together. But the fact remains that the new Chris that you are today compared to the old Chris who lived in pornography day after day after day, a perpetual problem. 
I mean, you have come a long way, and the fact is there are months and months and months of sobriety in between your stumble. I mean, what what is the longest period of sobriety that you've had the past four years? It, it, it was uh, about 13 months, I think. Yeah, praise God. So for you to go 13 months without looking at porn, that is a miracle, Chris. Praise be to God. And so, you know, I, I think of the old adage that says, uh, I'm not where I need to be, but thank God I'm not where I used to be. So uh, uh, we have no illusions. We know that Chris Bishop is not a perfect man. There's not a, I, I've never seen a halo above your head, not yet. Uh, so you're not perfect, but you're, but you guys are on your way and God has worked deeply and powerfully and you guys have a story of redemption and it's remarkable what God has done in your hearts, your lives, your marriage, and even in your sexual selves. So praise be to God. Um, I'd like to ask you one other, uh, question if I could, uh, and I think this will be our last question, but there's a brother who's been listening to your story, a Christian brother, he's out there, and he relates to more of your story that that he wishes he didn't relate so much to your story. Maybe he can identify with his struggle with lust and masturbation and porn. Maybe he's married. He's acting out sexually in violation of his marriage and his wife and his God, and he's trying to stop, and he can't. He's stuck. It's the cycle you know, uh, what would you say to this brother that's listening to us right now uh, who's indulging in the regular use of Internet pornography? Uh, what would be in your heart to share with him? I guess the, the biggest thing is just that it's not, it's not worth it. Um, I, I, I think even within the years since then, what, what I feel like God is, is revealing to me more and more powerfully what he has for us is so much better praise god than what we are trying to do for ourselves um like i said lust pornography all of that served a purpose in my life it did for very brief periods of time make me forget about the things that i wasn't liking you know it made me feel less stressed for for a period it made me you know there was a kind of release there was uh there was some pleasure there there was some satisfaction but it was always so brief it was always so fleeting it always led me to want want more and more and more and more um it, you know it it never truly satisfied but it it wet your appetite to make you feel like maybe it was um the deception of sin right absolutely and mm -hmm. and it just it felt like what i needed um that there was a reason i kept going back to it because i felt like i needed it and and what god is trying to communicate to me is that he has something so much better amen um god's way is way better than our way Oh, oh my goodness, the, the, the peace and the satisfaction that you get from resting in him and relying on him, um, it, it just, pornography doesn't hold a candle to it. it, it it's just, there's no comparison. Um, so, so that's the, so, so number one, there is a cost, and that cost isn't worth it, but even beyond the cost, and I think that's where, you know, I, I've still stumbled a couple of times when I start to try to walk in my own strength. And, and what God's showing me is I got to keep my eyes fixed on him. But more than that, I've got to realize I got to quit buying this lie that this stuff's actually good, that it's actually anything. Um, God has something for me that is great. And, and all pornography, you know, pornography is nothing beside it. Praise God. That's awesome, Chris. Well, listen, um, thank you so much for uh, being part of this podcast. Uh, I've interviewed my wife. She was my very first guest. Uh, you're my first official guest outside of my wife. And I don't think I could have had a better guest. I'm very uh, delighted and blessed and proud to be your friend and to be on this journey with you and your wife. 
I feel like we're uh, fellow strugglers, and I and I I think you're a good brother. I think you have a good heart. I think your story is a miracle, and uh, I'm really really proud of the uh, progress you guys have made. And I think God has bigger and better things in store for all of us. So so God bless you, Chris, and thanks for being here. Thanks, Tony. And uh, let me close by saying that if if you've enjoyed Chris's story. I've got a big, big treat for you, and you absolutely have to come back for our next episode because in our next episode, I'm going to invite Jamie Bishop to come in and tell us more of this story from her point of view and what this journey has been like for her. So it's going to be totally awesome. Come back and hear Jamie's heart and Jamie's story. And God bless you guys. Thanks for being here today, and I look forward to seeing you in our next episode. Thanks for listening. Visit powerofpurity.org for more resources and information. And if this podcast has been helpful or encouraging, please invite a friend to listen. Until next time, remember, there's power in purity. The Power of Purity Conference, available now at powerofpurity.org.